Well, I want to talk about this morning, (laughs) fitting, I suppose, when storms hit. (laughs) When storms hit, what do we do? And, um, you know, often we're faced with the storms of life, aren't we? And so I I want to encourage you this morning with, with the Word of God when storms hit, because we have had so many storms over the last several years that we can say have probably affected almost everyone. Um, And I'm I'm thinking about things like um, the circumstances that are going on in our world. Um, Our world is looking like a pretty unhealthy place to be right now. Um, And a lot of hopelessness around. Would you agree with that? There's just a lot of hopelessness. Um, Most of the world has seen sickness, whether it's pandemic-related or not. Uh, Many parts of the world are experiencing uh, storms like tornadoes and earthquakes and and those kinds of things that normally don't affect them or as quite as bad. A lot of calamities around. Um, There's wars breaking out, threats of wars which may or may not happen. We have rampant deception which is shaking the generations growing up today, causing a lot of anxiety and depression and disorders like never before in children and youth. Um, We have inflation, shortages at the grocery store, people living in fear because they don't know what's, what's coming down the pipe. There's so many uncertainties right now. Um, not knowing if these things are going to affect us personally or not. Uh, we have suicide levels through the roof due to all of the things going on in our world, not to mention things like uh, gender, gender dysphoria, which claims the life of youth and, and young adults, while the government is doing what they can to promote and allow medically assisted suicide, um, which is basically when you put it down to brass tacks, it becomes legal murder or legal suicide. Um, An article came through my email this past week, and they're wanting to pass a law that allows mothers of newborns, if they have a newborn that is born with a disability, to legally be able to euthanize them. A newborn. And I don't know how a mother could actually go through with that. My mother's heart just doesn't understand that. But they're wanting to be able to kill their newborns if they are born with a disability. Now, I know that's not a very happy starting to to what I have to say this morning. But I want us to think about how as a church and how as individuals we're going to respond to such things because they are a reality. They're part of our world at this point. And do we, as carriers of hope, do we take it to those who are looking for it? There's so many people looking for hope. Um, Or do we engage in those hopeless and fearful conversations, which fuel fear and disqualifies your testimony as a believer? Are we one of those that engages in, in those fueling conversations? Yeah, I agree with you on that. And, and yeah, oh, I know it's terrible. Or do we say, yeah, I know things are going on, but you know what? I have hope. How do we, how do we engage in life with people that way? How are you doing with that right now? The bottom root of all their anxiety is hopelessness and fear. What will happen to me if? What will happen to my family if? And you know the enemy loves it when we talk like that? We can't be carriers of hope for someone. Or when he can plant some thoughts in our head that induces a fear response, we can't be carriers of that hope. We're believing his lies that nothing is going to be right down the road. We're believing his lies that all hope for me is gone. And we know that that's not true according to scripture. And he loves it. And you know, quite frankly, I'm tired of pleasing him that way. I'm tired of pleasing the enemy that way. I'm tired of coming into agreement with the things that he tries to get me to believe. 
I'm tired of watching the church literally decay because the church has fallen into the traps of modern deception and hopeless thinking, succumbing to the fear of preaching the truth. Maybe you are too. I don't know. Maybe you are too. So I'm going to bounce off the scripture in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 18. Hebrews 2, 14 to 18, and it says this. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. And so... The scripture is talking about how Christ came so that we can have salvation and redemption. He came to experience our humanity so that he would know how we felt when we go through stuff. But it also says that he came so that we don't have to live in fear. Amen? Amen. We don't have to live in fear. We don't have much time left. And it's time to wake up and get moving. It's time to put our running shoes on and get going. God's provided us with a now moment where we can rise up to the occasion. And when we stand before him on judgment day that we will all face, I don't want his question to me to be, what did you do with your now moment? And me say, I was too scared. My response was fear. I... I buried that coin that you gave me. So hopefully I'd have something to present to you on Judgment Day. I don't want that to be my response. Our scripture tells us that Jesus came so that we don't have to fear anything, but we can have hope and salvation and help when we ask him. So here's the question. How can we have hope when the storm hit? Okay, ask me the question. Some of you want to know. Ask me the question. How can we have hope when the storms hit? Thank you. I can answer that question right now. Big storms can roll in. Suddenly, you know, the sky turns black and, and dark with worry. And it can happen in one brief conversation, a diagnosis, an accident, or a life-altering experience. And with those things, you know, we're left, thoughts swirling around, wondering how things are going to turn out. Why didn't I even see this coming? You know, if I had seen it coming, I could have been a little more prepared. But, you know, sometimes the more we know about what's coming, the less prepared we are. And the worse it seems. And it can hit hard and leave us fl- just flat. Bad news crashes. Pressures rise, anxiety rains down, heavy, strong, and an overwhelming rainstorm and torrent. Now, we can't stop storms from happening. They're going to happen. Scripture tells us that we're going to have storms in life, right? Okay, so we expect those to happen. But we can know where to run for cover. And so there's five things to remember. First thing, that storms will come. Isaiah 43, 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. It doesn't say if those things happen. It says when they happen. It's inevitable. It's unavoidable. But God still reminds us in his word that he will be with us in the midst of it all. Isn't that good news? No matter what we go through. Daniel still faced the lions. Joseph was still thrown in prison. Job still lost all he had. The disciples still faced persecution. Being a believer doesn't 
get us out of going through stuff. We, we have hard circumstances, but he promises that he will be with us. I myself can say that I have faced storms in life. I lost my dad to cancer. I had an unexpected death of my sister that I was close to. I've had issues, we've had issues with our kids, moments of division with my siblings. We've had financial strain. I've gone through a season of depression and my ongoing season of chronic pain. But we all face stuff in life that we could class as storms. And the enemy comes in like a flood sometimes, doesn't he? Isaiah 59, 19. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And when you and I are praying through the storms of life, we can raise up a standard against the enemy. You will not take me down. You will not put me under. Because my God says that I can be victorious. My God says that I can overcome. My God says that you have to go underneath my feet, not vice versa. And so when the enemy comes in like a flood, God gives us the strength. The enemy will try to wreak havoc in our lives. He loves disaster. He loves it when we struggle. His whole aim is to steal, kill, and destroy. That's his goal for you. And often when a few hard things start to happen, it can feel like chaos. You know, sometimes those just the little stuff that comes, it can feel like such a mountain. And it's hard to get control again. And we can end up feeling just abandoned. We can feel alone. Yet God's word reminds us that we never fight alone. He will never leave us to fight alone. He won't leave us to ourselves to pick up the broken pieces. God himself will fight for us no matter what we face. On Thursday, Life Nights, you heard Peter talking. We were take, talking about how difficulties make it easy to just give up on God. That was the, the last session that we had. It's so easy to throw in the towel when stuff starts to happen, when circumstances come, and it's hard to keep... Faith in a good God, because we wonder, God, where are you? You're supposed to be good. And, you know, we're tempted to walk away because we face circumstances. But, you know, that's what the enemy wants. He wants you to walk away from your calling. He wants you to fall short of your kingdom purpose. He wants to have that chaos in your life to throw you off course and send you crashing with doubt and anxiety and fear. But God's plan is to bring you through the storm so that you can reach your destiny and fulfill your calling. And often it's on the other side of that storm that we end up having a wonderful testimony to share with somebody. Somebody is waiting for your testimony. You think of it that way. Somebody is waiting for your testimony because of what you are going through. Second, we heed the warnings and be prepared. Matthew 24, 42, Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day the Lord is coming. Now, this is talking about when Jesus comes back, but the principle of the verse remains the same. Stay awake. Turn to somebody beside you and say, wake up. Wake up. It's time to wake up. God reminds us in his word to stay aware, to wake up to what surrounds us. It's too easy to ignore the warnings. It's too easy just to try to keep on thinking our own way and, and thinking that somehow, you know, we've got the wisdom to get through this or that maybe we'll be spared somehow. But we need his wisdom to know when to stay, when to go, what direction to go. There's a lot of forks in the road, too. Do you notice that? And so we have to say, God, do I go this way or this way? We need to be listening and into his word. We can't close our eyes and hope it all goes away. Believe me, I've tried that with the snow. It doesn't work. 
As a church, we need to be aware of the issues going on in our world, in our community, so that we can respond. We have to be prepared to respond. And this means talking about things and discussing things with one another in a way that promotes hope. Speak life to each other. Encourage each other's faith that God is in control. He sees where you're at. And be prepared. Ephesians 5, 15 to 17. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Be very careful how you live. Another scripture says, be very careful how you listen. How you listen. Listen well. Why? Because the days are evil. Don't be foolish. Life is unpredictable. Storms come without much warning sometimes. And the best way to stay spiritually prepared is to stay in close relationship with our God. Walking wisely. Every day we need him. The fresh filling of his spirit every day. And I've said it before, you know, I need to go back to him to get filled every day. Why? Because I leak. And I need more. I need more. And the better that we are prepared on the inside, the more equipped we will be to press through the storm and to be able to share with others the good news of hope. And we have to be ruthless with sin issues. We have to keep our heart right with God and with one another. Stay in close fellowship with other believers. Stay connected to the church family and worship. Because this is, this is where we grow. This is where we learn to serve. This is where we are encouraged. I don't know about you, but I love being around the family of God. You know, there's just something special about it. And it's so easy to run from God or stop going to church or being together with other believers and trying just to make it on our own when, when things get tough. But if we're prepared for battle, if we're prepared to relentlessly overcome, you know what that means? Relentlessly overcome then we can not only be victorious, but we can have a testimony of hope to somebody else. So think for a moment. How would we respond if a mother comes to you, me, anybody here, and says she's just been informed that her baby has a disability and the doctors say it'd be better for everyone if they just put it down? How would we respond to that? Are you ready to respond to that? You need to have the answers to those things. Don't send them to me. (laughs) I can only deal with one at a time. How would we respond if somebody might tell you that their son or daughter has just announced that they are gay or lesbian or transgender or queer or any one of the other things, and they don't know what to do as a Christian parent? Have you thought about that? It's prevalent in our society. What do we do with that information? If they're telling you this, they're looking for hope from you. How would we respond if a parent informs us with tears that their teenager is talking about suicide? How do we respond to that? Again, our last life night, the speaker talked about how he played for the NFL. And he always played... On Sunday, he said, thinking about Monday. He always played thinking about the next day. And he did that because his coach would sit him down the next day and replay the tape of the game where he was able to watch everything that he did. He was able to see the times, the moves, the plays that he was prepared for and the moves that he wasn't so prepared for and messed up. And his coach would ask him two questions that would be answered by watching the video. 
And the two questions are this. Did you play to represent the decal on your helmet? Did you play to represent the team? And did you play according to the rules given to you in the playbook? Did you play to represent the team you're on? And did you play according to the rule book? And the point is here that we have to be living to represent our coach. And we have to be living by the playbook. Big amen. amen. If we live thinking about tomorrow, if we live thinking about tomorrow might be my day to talk to the coach and see a review of the tape, it'll cause us to live differently today. And when the storms come, we will be ready to help others. Maybe you've had this experience too where when I was a kid growing up in church, they talked about um, the second coming of Christ as in it could happen any second and we have to be ready. And knowing that it could happen any second, it could happen when I sleep, it could happen tomorrow, it could happen next year, but that kept me alert to what am I doing right now? And I think that one thought was a lot of my saving grace. You know, a lot of people might think that, you know, I, I don't want to deal with that and couldn't handle that. But for me, it was my saving grace. That to think about, I never know. And so my now moment needs to be right. My now moment needs to be living for him. And maybe you've had that experience as well. Uh, if you've been in church for many years, um, you might remember those kinds of teaching. And so make your now moment count. Number three, know where to find refuge. Psalm 46, 2, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. When facing a storm, we instinctively know how to find a, a safe place to be protected from the elements. If a tornado hits, where do you go? Maybe to the basement, okay? A place where you can find you know, security all around. If an earthquake hits, where do you go? Huh? Under a table. Under a table. If an earthquake hits, you don't go standing beside places like the CN Tower, right? Where a million tons of concrete could fall on you. You find a, a safe place, and in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, if there's an open space that I could run to that maybe wouldn't have that. Um, I don't know, I've never been in an earthquake. When an economic crisis hits, who do we go to? You know, um, God is the owner of everything, right? He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. There, there's nothing that he cannot do. When economic crisis hits, we go to God. When it seems like war is breaking all, all over the place, we go to God. When something happens that causes us deep anxiety or grief, we go to God. He's our refuge and our strength. In all that we face, no matter what may fill our days, we know that we have a place to run to. God is our refuge, our constant help, our safety, and he's the only one who can walk on the water in your storm. He's the only one who will, who still reigns over the storm. He's the only one who can speak to the storm and the winds obey his voice. He says, peace be still. If we don't know where to go or if we do know where to go and just don't go there, then we can't show others the way. Number four, God is over the flood. Psalm 29, verses 10 to 11. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. What a great reminder that God is still all powerful over the floods, over every kind of weather. He sits enthroned over the flood. And as king over the flood, everything must come into subjection to him.
Every crown must submit itself to him. He is still in control, and he knows the way. He understands what concerns us. Our flood may not be a literal standing in water today. It may be circumstances that we find ourselves in that wreak havoc on our lives. We may feel overwhelmed like we're drowning in all the struggles. We may be knee-deep in hurt, wading through all the mess. But these are often the moments that test our faith, isn't it? It tests what we're really made of on the inside. It tests our perseverance. It tests, tests our proximity to Christ, really. Or where we think we are in proximity to Christ. And these are often the times that put our heart and faith muscles to the test. But what does scripture tell us in these moments? Ephesians 6, 13. When we have done everything we can to what? To stand. I do everything that I can do, but God, you know exactly what else needs to be done. And I'm going to stand. Often, the, the trials that we go through are about spiritual warfare, learning to fight, learning to stand against the enemy, learning to raise that standard against him in the name of Jesus. And so use the power and authority that God has given to you to stand. Uh, Romans 5, 3 to 5. We know that our suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Perseverance brings on character and hope. James 1, verses 2 to 4, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking anything. Don't doubt for a minute that he's not there. He's over every trouble that we face. And you don't need to face it alone. Ever. Say ever. ever. You don't need to face it alone. Not only do you have God, but you have family. Right? So two things God gives us in the midst of the flood. He gives us strength and he blesses us with peace. Psalm 1835, you make your saving help my shield and your right hand sustains me. We will be sustained. Number five, life comes back. Genesis 9:13. I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Now so often we think that our circumstances will never go away or that our circumstances are going to determine what my future looks like. And, you know, sometimes our, our circumstances do change something about uh, our future, but it doesn't determine God's sovereignty over our lives or our future. And it doesn't determine the ability to overcome and be victorious. But in those moments, we tend to see the, the circumstances as this big, or as this big, and God is this big. And when we see it that way, and the enemy wants to convince you that it's that way, it's hard then to be able to look at the future and say, yeah, I'm an overcomer. We have to see God as this big and our circumstances this big. The enemy will lie to you and tell you that you will never see better days. Your finances will crush you. He'll try to convince you that your problems or circumstances or that family member that you've been praying for you know, nothing's going to work out. And it's so easy to believe those lies when we see the circumstances bigger than God. Second Corinthians 4, 7 to 9 says this, but, if, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. And that's what we need to say when we're going through stuff, the stuff of life. 
I'm not crushed, I'm not in despair, I'm not abandoned, and I'm not destroyed. Even in the face of huge loss and big storms, they do not have the final say over your life. And as believers, we are kept safe in the hands of our Creator. The winds can blow, devastating loss can come, but God is Redeemer. And he's the only one who can take what seems to be utter destruction and somehow turn it around for good. He did it for Job. He did it for Joseph. He did it for Noah. And he's the same God today. He's the same God today. He is forever the same. He is still faithful to his promise and to his word. So what's this all about? What's this all to say? Well, God is bigger than our circumstances. He promises victory, his victory. You know, sometimes I think I want it done, I, I want to see the end result my way, but God's way, God's victory is better. He promises that we can be overcomers. God is in our storm. The storm still must obey God's voice. Our circumstances do not have to define our future. And we can find comfort in the God of all comfort and peace. Do you agree with all those? We can find comfort in him. And our circumstances do not have to define who we are. Scripture defines who we are. David reminds us that we can choose to praise God in the midst of the storm. And when we forget why we have reason to praise the Lord, he reminds us with this. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not his benefits, who forgives all your sin and heals all of your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like an eagle's. You know, when, when, when there's a storm brewing, you know where the eagle goes? The eagle uses his wings, the span and the strength that it has, and it goes up through the storm cloud and soars above it. That's where the eagle waits out the storm, above the storm cloud. And we can do that too in the storms of life. Scripture says that he bears us up like on eagle's wings. And we don't have to go through the turmoil, I guess, of the storm. We might have to, to go through circumstances, but we know who's in control of the storm, and we can rise above it and stand victorious. Amen? That's good news. And so perhaps you've been feeling a little overwhelmed with either world events or maybe you're going through some stuff in, in just in life. Perhaps you're working through circumstances that you're not sure which way to go. Maybe you're worried a little bit about what's to come in the future. Maybe you just need a reminder that there is still a reason to praise the Lord. God doesn't promise us a life without storms, but he promises us to be in the storm. We just have to call out to him. And so if you would like prayer this morning, that the God that we just described, that you said amen to, would speak into your storm. We're going to close with a song this morning. And I just invite you to come on up to the front and I'll pray for you, that God would speak into your storm and that the wind and the waves in your storm would listen to the voice of God. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me?
Lord God, we thank you that you have given to us the ability to rise above the storm. I thank you, God, that you have made your people victorious, that you have made us overcomers, and that, Father, we just have to cry out to you. We just have to uh, get into your presence, get into your word, and find that proximity close to you. Father, we just thank you that you are our helper in times of need. You are our strength, our shield. You are the one who is... Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. You know the things of our past and you know what's coming in the future. You are the same God yesterday, today, and forever. The same God who, who rescued Noah can rescue us. We thank you, Jesus, that you are coming soon. And I pray that as we wait for your coming, that our now moment would be filled with the ability to share hope with others. That our now moment would count for something in king, in the kingdom. That our now moment would produce a harvest. So God, I pray that our now moment, Father, would honor you and allow us to be that testimony and example to others. Take our hurt, take our circumstances, take the things that we are going through, and on the other side of that, God, make us a great testimony for you. And so, Father, I thank you for all who are here today. And I pray, Father, that if there are those who are struggling with either issues of life or issues concerning them uh, of what's going on in the world, that, Father, you would be their peace and comfort and ever-present help in time of trouble. And so, Father, I just want to pray for each heart that they would know the God who loves them. And, Father, if there is anybody here who does not know the God of love, who has never come into relationship with you, I pray, Father, that today would be the day when they would say yes to Jesus, when they would say yes to the God who loves them so much, to the God who desires good things for them. And that, Father, salvation would be in the house today. And we praise you, God, for all that you are doing. In Jesus' name, amen. And then we're going to close with a song. And if that's you that you would like prayer, I just invite you to come up.